Lamar Odom's tell-all book, Darkness to Light, a memoir, is officially out on bookshelves, and if you haven't read it yet, you're in for a juicy treat. I'm spilling the most shocking revelations from the book about his relationship with Chloe, his addictions, and his wild past. Don't go anywhere, the details you want are coming up right now. Hey everyone, it's Devin Howard. We've always got the latest news about your favorite stars, so make sure you click subscribe, hit that bell to be notified when we post a new video, and give this video a thumbs up. Now, let's get into the crazy details from Lamar's book. He really didn't leave anything to the imagination. Lamar got raw and real about all of his lowest moments, and there are more than you probably even realized. Lamar and Chloe had a very heavily publicized marriage and later divorce. Everything was documented on the reality show Keeping Up With The Kardashians, which gave Lamar, a basketball star, a taste of the Hollywood limelight. He says that in the beginning, things were perfect for the happy couple, but they quickly went south after his drug use started getting out of control. Let's go back to where his troubles began. Lamar started playing around with dishonesty and lies as early as high school. He almost failed out of high school and admitted that he paid a pastor to alter his grades. He forked over 15 grand to change his failing marks to A's and B's, which is a huge deal in high school. He also says he was a terrible test taker, which made the SATs a pretty difficult obstacle for him. Instead of trying to pass them through hard work and studying, he hired someone else to take his SATs. The person who took this test for him didn't get caught, but his unusual score of 1200, when he was typically a C student, was a huge red flag. It was so alarming that the University of Nevada, Las Vegas revoked his scholarship. Because of that, he was forced to sit out of his freshman year of college basketball, the ultimate punishment for an athlete like Lamar. Regarding his academically challenged high school years, Lamar said that he felt he was done an injustice by the adults in his life. In the book, he says, There was a time in high school where they just kind of swept it under the rug when I failed something. I failed like four classes my freshman year. That's supposed to be it for you. He said that teachers and adults cut him so much slack because he was a talented and nice kid. In the moment, he was probably stoked he got off easy, but ultimately it fed his bad habit of lying and cheating. We'll get into that later. He he elaborated on his lack of discipline as a teen, writing, When you're the number one player in the country, things come your way that you can't even explain. He continued saying, I think I was betrayed by the adults who kind of put me in that position because I didn't even try. I think if I would have tried, I would have done all right on the test. To just not give me a chance almost called me dumb. Of the current chaos, Lamar said the parents must have, quote, taken the wrong route and that if they had gone about it differently, they might have had a better result for their children. He he also says he wouldn't fault parents for making donations to schools to help their children get in, but he can't get behind completely falsifying their academic standing. His own problems with that is likely a big reason why. Despite his rocky high school years, Lamar successfully made it to the NBA, and after playing with the Clippers, he moved to the Miami Heat. After his relocation, he bought a brand new six bedroom, nine bathroom home and needed to christen it with a huge party attended by all of his friends and every strip groupie, and side piece they were connected to. Now this is one of the major shockers from his book. The wild bash went on well into the evening and then turned into a sex party where every person's fantasy and desire had been met, according to the basketball player. He writes, All in all, there were about 40 women there and it didn't take long for half of them to get naked. It escalated quickly into a full-blown orgy. He describes it saying, quote, People were having sex in the pool, the jacuzzi, on the lawn, in chairs, standing up against a heat lamp everywhere. I met a pair of 20-year-old twins who had zero problem with any request. For most of the night, I kept them to myself. So it should come as no surprise then that Lamar is pretty confident he has slept with over 2,000 women in his lifetime. 2,000 women. That is a huge number. He says he doesn't remember most of their names because they were one-night stands. He says, I have been obsessed with sex for as long as I can remember. There were too many strippers to count. It wasn't a big deal, but often I would pay them. I never thought less of them. He dives deep into his struggles with sex addiction and said that he would sleep with five or six girls a week, but his demons, quote, tormented me on the one night I went home alone. I needed women as an outlet and escape. Of course, when you're in that kind of headspace, you're probably not thinking very clearly. Lamar admitted that one of the problems he faced was not using protection and dealing with the aftermath. He says, quote, I've paid for 
plenty of abortions over the years. He isn't proud of that, but it's part of his history and he needs to be able to accept it. He claims sex helped him fill the void left from when his mother died when he was 12. He writes, quote, I wanted to be loved, but I could never find love. His addiction to sex helped fuel his addiction to drugs, which would prove to create a serious challenge for him as he navigated his acceptance onto the USA men's basketball team at the 2004 Olympics. In an excerpt from the book, he says that being offered a spot on the team was, quote, one of the biggest honors in my career, but his happiness quickly turned to anxiety as Olympic officials let him know he would have to pass a drug test before joining the team. Apparently, Lamar was smoking weed every day that summer and frantically began looking for a way to pass the test. The solution he came across was to order a prosthetic penis online, so he did, and he asked his trainer to pee into it. Lamar says he was incredibly paranoid it wouldn't work, but it did. He passed the test and he was warmly welcomed to Team USA. He went to such great lengths to cover his issues, it's pretty terrifying and would eventually lead to his first overdose in the mid-2000s. He was rushed to the hospital and doctors claimed he was simply dehydrated. They gave him an IV of fluids to revive him, but he knew the truth. He knew he overdosed. Of the ordeal, he says, time slowed down. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't breathe. It sounds like a terrifying low point. In the memoir, he details his relationship with Khloe Kardashian, but before he was with her, he dated Taraji P. Henson, and he recalls meeting her. He writes, I don't think I ever connected with another black woman as deeply as I did with Taraji, and to be honest, because of that fact, it hurt that much more when we broke up soon after I decided not to travel with her. The actress was filming Karate Kid in China and asked Lamar to join her over there. He refused because he didn't know how easy it would be to feed his addiction to cocaine in a foreign country. He continued on detailing his feelings about his relationship with Taraji and said, As a professional athlete, you're stereotyped for dating white women. Here I had this beautiful, successful, loving sister and it gave me a sense of pride to be by her side. It's just that I met Taraji at the wrong time in my life. Following his split from Taraji, he started his romance with Chloe. It was a whirlwind to say the least. He describes in vivid detail the night he met the denim jean designer, quote, I wasn't a big TV fan, but I knew enough to recognize Rob. I still remember his blue Dodgers hat, which he wore backwards. We ended up in his booth and about an arm's length away was this woman with huge eyes. I was immediately attracted to her. We started talking and hit it off. She told me her name was Chloe. I just kept staring at her eyes and thinking how much they were reminded me of my mother's. But really, I was just telling her things she'd probably heard a thousand times, and I'm just thinking, how can I get her back to my hotel to smash? Ah, oh, so romantic. Lamar acknowledges his crude thinking, writing he never knew he'd fall so head over heels for her. He says, hey look, I didn't know this was going to be my wife. After they talked for about 15 minutes, Chloe did decide to go back to his hotel room, but Lamar quickly realized nothing was going to happen between the two of them. They quote, talked for hours and planned to meet for dinner the next day. During their official first date, Lamar realized that Chloe was the real deal. The conversations they had were quote, just as good as the night before, and spending time one on one with her showed him how intelligent and thoughtful she was. He said, quote, unlike me, she was always on time and never missed appointments. I loved her for that and wanted those things to rub off on me. She had this endearing kind of OCD where she couldn't stand having a mess in her house and would constantly rearrange things after I unsettled them. For the next 30 days, the two were inseparable. Their connection and chemistry was immediate and they scarcely left each other's side. His connection to Chloe also gave him an in with the famous family and he recalls how they accepted him right away. In the book, he says, She introduced me to her family, and even though I had seen Keeping Up with the Kardashians a few times, I was taken aback at how close-knit they were. They would squabble and argue, but love always prevailed. Their tight bond was comforting to him. He reveals, quote, I never had a strong family unit, and as a 30-year-old man, it was something I still craved deeply. I'd always wanted brothers and sisters, and all of a sudden, I had five. Lamar also admits that being part of Chloe's life and developing relationships with every member of the Kardashian family is one of the things he is most proud of. He said it's quote, right up there with winning a championship and having kids.
Their chemistry was overwhelming, and Lamar was thriving in his new family, so after a month, he and Chloe decided to tie the knot. Perhaps Lamar was aware of how his decision to marry Chloe impacted his ex, or maybe the life changes were simply too overwhelming for him, but around the time that he got married and was newly accepted into the Kardashian family, he started falling even deeper into drugs. The memoir outlines how most of the time he was either really high or with Chloe, and having the cameras in his face for the reality show ended up blurring his own reality. Things didn't go straight downhill. He said, quote, For a while it was bliss, and I was literally the happiest I've ever been in my life. We were one of the most famous couples in Hollywood, and we made more money together than we had individually at any other point in our lives. He fondly remembers the start of their life together, saying, The Kardashians had the number one rated show on TV, I was an NBA champion, and the Lakers were barreling toward a second NBA title and a third finals appearance in a row. But the success, money, fame, and celebrity Celebrity status grew intoxicating for the athlete, and he struggled to hide his drug problem from his wife. He remembers running down to his man cave whenever Chloe grew suspicious of what he was doing when she wasn't around. She'd question him about it, and he'd get defensive and leave. Chloe would then just drop it. Around this time, they started up their spin off show, Chloe and Lamar. He says he didn't mind the attention, but it did take time getting used to all the cameras. Lamar, quote, marveled at how easily Chloe handled it all. I guess she was used to it. She gave me pep talks and told me to block out what I could, but my mind just didn't function like that. As the show grew in popularity, so did Lamar's drug use. He started to resent how he couldn't, quote, move in secret anymore, and the added pressure of television cameras, telephoto lenses, and video cameras caused his habits to be an even harder challenge to keep hidden. In a deeply personal point of his memoir, Lamar discusses how his sex drive was through the roof, he couldn't keep the coke out of his nose, and would snort insane amounts of it before running upstairs to sleep with Chloe. He said, she didn't ask any questions. I'd always hit the lights and take care of business. Even though Chloe wasn't confronting her husband about his bizarre behavior, she was certainly taking notes. Then, on one fateful day, Lamar said that Chloe went down to his basement and knocked on the door. She could tell he was in a drug-induced paranoia, whacking golf clubs at the drywall to find hidden cameras and mics. There weren't any. Chloe called his friend Greg to help him out, and when she went down to talk to him, he said, quote, I opened the door suddenly and grabbed her forcefully by the shoulders, which frightened her. What the f are you doing? I screamed out of my mind. You trying to embarrass me in front of my friends? I'll f***ing kill you. You don't know what I'm capable of. Lamar describes the moment he threatened to kill Chloe as a new low for his relationship with her and for his life. You would think that this would be rock bottom for the athlete, but it wasn't. In his Good Morning America interview, Lamar said, You had to be scared at that point in time. I'm thinking about it now, like, I couldn't believe how I was treating that queen like that. Hindsight is always 2020. Lamar describes more of the lows he faced, like the time Chloe caught him in an extremely compromising position. She was able to monitor his whereabouts by checking his black card statements, so she began following the charges, which led her to the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, where he had gotten a room to party and do drugs with strippers. Lamar says, quote, Around midnight, I heard a pounding on the door. I got up and looked through the peephole, shocked to see Chloe, Kris Jenner, and their security team in the hallway. Way. Apparently, the women had asked the front desk for his room number and they gave them a key card to the room. Chloe barged in and was confronted by an image no wife should ever have to see. Lamar remembers the incident and says, quote, There were naked girls everywhere. Chloe opened the door and pounced on the first girl she saw. Lamar claims that Chloe just kept pounding these girls even though they were protesting. Security had to jump in and pull Chloe off of the strippers. Chris was reportedly screaming the entire time. After that, Chloe ordered Lamar to pack up his things while security removed all the drugs from the hotel room. This wasn't the first time Lamar had been unfaithful to Chloe. He confessed that cheating was, quote, a regular part of his marriage to her. He wrote, I had broken my vows with Chloe so many times it's just impossible for me to remember them all. I don't know why Chloe stayed with me. Eventually, their relationship crumbled under the pressure of Lamar's secrets and cheating. They eventually filed for divorce, which is when he went to Love Ranch in Las Vegas 
to have some fun. He was at the brothel on a four day bender and was found nearly dead, but he insists he wasn't doing drugs at the time, which adds a confusing and complicated plot twist to his story and is perhaps the most outrageous revelation in the memoir. The basketball player was found with a lethal concoction of drugs and alcohol in his system. He did claim he'd been drinking alcohol, but he insists he never snorted coke or did any other drugs. He thinks he was, quote, poisoned by the brothel's owner, Dennis Hoff. In his interview with The View, Lamar maintained that theory, saying, quote, I don't know if he poisoned me. He tried. He almost succeeded. He was rushed to the hospital, and doctors claim they found virtually every drug imaginable in his body. He suffered from a heart attack, a stroke, and seizures, which ultimately put him in a coma. Upon hearing the news, Chloe rushed to his side, followed by her family, and took care of him day in and day out. Despite being in the middle of their divorce, she still ran to be with him. In the memoir, he remembers how they rallied support for him. Quote, Chloe didn't shower for four days and brushed her teeth in a small room next door. Kim's resilience was incredible too. He also said in an interview, they really are strong. I don't think they get credit for it enough. If you've been through what they've been through and are still as tight as they are, they're past the money. Lamar says Chloe was there with him while he was learning to walk and talk again. He says, quote, she moved me into a house in Calabasas in the same community that she lived. He revealed, quote, that was probably my time. I didn't know how to go about that. Maybe I was shameful. Probably a lot of subconscious things going on in my head at the time. It really wasn't that long ago, but it seems so distant. Lamar went back to using drugs and they finalized their divorce. In his book, he details how his friends staged an intervention with him and even even though his children were there crying and pleading with him to get help, he still didn't. He went back to drugs until a month later when he got an offer for a show to document his rehabilitation with a $200,000 check up front. His friends told him they'd support him doing the show as long as he admitted himself to a 30-day program at a rehab facility. He did, and when he left, he wrote that he, quote, felt healthy and refreshed in a way I'd never felt before. I thought then that I was gonna be all right. Since then, Lamar has been steady and stable. He admits that he still drinks occasionally and smokes weed to help with his anxiety, but he doesn't do drugs and he can't remember the last time he had cocaine. He's still hopeful that he and Chloe can resume their love affair, but realizes the likelihood of that happening is pretty slim. The two have been in touch recently. She texted him about some of the revelations in his book and she also openly discussed her decision to stay by his side after his overdose. She wanted to be there for him and since their divorce wasn't finalized, she was technically his next of kin. Lamar has made the ultimate comeback, and even though he's still working on regaining his strength, he's making strides in his recovery. He'll be playing in the Big Three coming up soon. It'll be his first chance to show off his athleticism in recovery. He has said that his focus now isn't to pick back up with his professional basketball career, but he is interested in at least trying to be the athlete he once was. But for now, he's focusing on living his life and embracing the time he has with his friends and family. He concluded his book with acknowledgements. He mentions friends and family who stuck by him through thick and thin. He honors Chloe and calls her the love of his life. He says, I wish I could have been a better man. Thank you to the entire Kardashian family for embracing me and giving me an incredible kind of love. I will always be Lammy. From Darkness to Light is a compelling, heartbreaking story and reading it really made me grateful that Lamar was able to get out of his toughest times. I'm looking forward to seeing what the future has in store for him. He has a good heart and I know we can expect great things from him. What was the most shocking thing you found out about Lamar and his addiction? Let me know in the comments. Make sure you subscribe to Holly Scoop. Give that bell a tap for notifications from us and like this video. Thanks for tuning in with me, everyone. I'm Devin Howard, and I'll see you later.